Welcome to the Kung Fu Mama Show. Today we have a very special guest, Chelsea DeSinger. She is a former personal trainer, a blogger, speaker, and a spotting author. And she is also the mother of two amazing girls. Hello, Chelsea. How are you today? Hi, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on the show. We're so delighted to have you. And you have two amazing daughters. So could you tell us a little bit about after birth? I heard that you struggled with postpartum depression for six years. Would you share some of your journey with us? Yes. Um, it was really pretty crazy. Before I had my kids, I was happy, energetic. I had a great job helping people. I had a married to the love of my life. I was pregnant. I was so excited to have my first baby. And I went into the hospital and I had a pretty complicated pregnancy. I was really exhausted when my first daughter, Jordan, was born. And I just got really emotional and I started to cry. And I literally didn't stop crying for six years. Uh, it was bizarre. It was like I went in one person and I left the hospital, a totally different person. And um, I had never experienced this kind of uh, just emotional roller coaster and 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 the depression and uh, so it took it took a long time a long six years doesn't sound like a long time but when you're in a dark deep hole every day feels like eternity oh that so, that feels like a long time sounds like a long time I can't yeah, even imagine <laughs> yes so yeah. could you tell us a little bit about a little more about exactly what are the things that you felt and how did you know or were you able to were you able to decipher between how it was before and after uh well at the beginning some people had mentioned something like baby blues you know so i thought okay maybe i have the baby blues you know your hormones are, are just going way down after you've delivered the baby and um, but weeks turned into months and, and month after month. And so at the beginning, I tried to will myself out of it. You know, oh, I can do this. And, you know, I can I can get over this. And um, after a couple of years, I started to feel hopeless. At that point, I was like, I've tried every, everything. And everyone's told me I've done every strategy in the book. And I just can't seem to get over this. I was able to have the strength and energy to be thank God, a good mom for Jordan. I would give her mm -hmm. everything I had. But then when she went to bed, I would just lay on the floor and cry. And I would just cry. I was miserable. I cried day, I cried night. Um, and then I got really ashamed because mm -hmm. I, you know, you see in the movies, you know, people deliver their babies and it's the happiest moment of their life and their family's complete. And I didn't feel that way. I felt sad and I felt lonely and I felt scared and overwhelmed and tired. And I think part of the struggle was that I didn't understand why my life didn't look like what I thought it was supposed to look like have, after having a baby. And I couldn't wrap my mind around, but I thought it was supposed to be like this. So there's something wrong with me or, you know, not understanding um, what to expect having a new baby. So it was a very difficult time um, in my life. I'm thankful for my husband's support. Um, but I, I gave Jordan everything I had, but I didn't have anything after that. I would feed her and then just go cry and put her to bed and then cry. You know, it's just it's tough. That's so that's so difficult. Do you know what it was that made you stay in that space for so long? Well, I think there was a couple things. One, obviously hormones. Uh, my hormones did not stabilize um, at, for, for a long time. So I actually eventually ended up getting help, thank God. Um, I waited way too long for that. And um, that kind of helped me a little bit was the hormones. But I think there's a couple things that I personally did that kind of kept me in that space longer than I think I would have needed to stay. And um, one of them was I was really hard on myself. Mm. I expected myself to be the perfect mom and I was going to do everything just right. And I put so much pressure on myself. And I think that pressure also leads to exhaustion. I was just tired, tired all the time. And I didn't mm -hmm. give myself rest. I didn't give myself permission to make a mistake or, I mean, I had to make, don't laugh at me. <laughs> okay. But I, I will not laugh at you. All of the 
Gordon's food. I had to go buy it organic from the farmer's market, hand make all of it at the right temperature. So all the vitamins would be in the food and package each one and, wow. and slowly um, defrost each one and feed it to her. I mean, it was just, it's like the, the thought of even just being able to just get one jar of baby food and give it to her was like, oh, I'm a horrible mother. Like I've just put so much pressure. And I think, especially with our first kid, we put so much pressure on ourselves to be the perfect mom. And, um, I think at the end of the day, I mean, depression, depression is a tricky thing. And, um, sometimes you can try to do everything right and you, and you can't control it. So I'm not necessarily saying that I maybe would have just clicked out of depression had I done these things differently, but I think that these things just compounded the depression was never giving myself rest, Mm -hmm. always feeling like I'm doing it wrong. Um, another thing that I did that I would love to share just because I feel like this is one of the worst things I did. So if anybody's struggling with depression is I was so ashamed. I was Mm. so embarrassed before Jordan was born. I was, uh, I had a job helping a lot of people and I was very well known for helping people. And then all of a sudden I'm the person who needs help, but I don't Mm. know how to ask for help. Right. And all these people look up to me as, Oh, Chelsea, she's got it together and look at all these things she's doing with her life. And all of a sudden I can't do anything. I'm, I'm a mess. Mm. And so what I did was I isolated myself Mm. and I didn't want to see people. I didn't want to talk to people. Didn't want to share. You know, nobody could know. It was like my deep, deep, my depression became like a deep, dark secret that I kept inside me, just ate away at me. And I think that one, we need people. We all know that we need people in our lives. But I think even more than that, when I isolated myself to this extent, the only voice I could hear in my head was negativity. You know, it was Mm -hmm. just negative, negative, negative. And so I wouldn't hear anybody else's voice. I didn't have a friend who would be like, Chelsea, it's okay. You're going to get through it. Or a friend to say, oh my gosh, I went through the same thing as you, you know, you're going to be okay. Like I had nobody. And that was the worst part. Thank God for my husband. He was incredible, Mm -hmm. but I needed other women you know, who could, who were doing the same thing I was doing, exhausted and tired and stressing out. And and I needed other voices in my head. So I isolated myself um, because I wasn't ashamed. And that was probably the thing that kept me in it the longest, because when you're emotionally distraught, your thoughts are going to be distraught. And then you're just going to keep repeating those, those thoughts go on like replay. And the next Mm -hmm. thing you know, after weeks and weeks and weeks of all this negativity, you're just going more and more downhill. So Mm -hmm. sorry, not to ramble, (laughs) but no, 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 not at all. Kind of um, something that I think kind of kept me in the place longer than it should have. Mm -hmm. I see. So in that period of time, what would you feel was the most difficult part that you, that you went through? Um, I think probably uh, becoming a new mom was hard for me. I am not a natural mom. (laughs) I've learned to become a mother. Um, I mean, I love kids and and all that, but I'm a very driven go, go, go succeed at everything I touch. You know, I gotta be the hardest, the best, the fastest. That's not motherhood, especially when you become a stay at home mom where, (laughs) You know, you don't have like your job on the side to kind of fulfill some of those like goals and, you know, success and things like that, climbing the corporate ladder. So just becoming a mom was a real big change for me, changing diapers all day. Just, you know, some of those things just weren't, I have a couple of friends who all they want to do is be stay at home moms. And I think it's amazing. And they just love it. And it's so fulfilling for them. For me, it was like a choice that I made that I had to grow into. Mm-hmm. It wasn't yep. just natural for me. I literally had to let go of certain parts of my life. But when I was in my young twenties, I didn't understand how life is seasons and like, it's okay to let go of one dream for a season to pick up something else and then come back to it. I, I just wasn't mature enough to understand that. So in my mind, I was like, my life is over. I will never succeed at anything again. You know, it's so dramatic. Um, now I realize, right. especially my kids are 11 and 13. I'm like starting to get that freedom again. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can, I'm, I'm, you know, um, I'm trying to write a book right now. I'm starting a business on the side. I'm starting to do these things. And I'm like, oh my gosh, Chelsea, like 
life is seasons and it's okay to give up this ambition on this area to pursue. And I'll never regret being a stay at home mom. I have loved it. I've done it for 13 years and I have been able to pour into my kids in amazing ways. And I'm so glad, especially now that I'm old enough to realize that these 13 years doesn't mean sacrificing the rest of my life. I still have my whole yeah. life ahead of me, you know, to pursue these other things I've kind of put on the shelf. I, I can do it and that's okay. Um, but I didn't understand mm -hmm. that at the time. I thought I had to choose one or the other. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, so I think another thing, uh, was just kind of losing. And then I kind of talked about this, but, um, losing myself as a stay at home mom, I think that was just mm -hmm. hard. I lost myself. I didn't really know who I was anymore without success, success, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but, but again, learning to, to let go of that success birthed new things inside of me, mm -hmm. um, humility, compassion, patience, um, learning to love myself without seeing all of these external successes, you know, all of this right. inner work that needed to be done in me. I mean, my kids have truly made me such a better person. You know, but at I the time that. when I was depressed, I couldn't see the beautiful work that was being done in my heart. Right. All I saw was the struggle and the pain and, you know, all, but I was building important things in the inside, but it did not feel like it. That is so beautiful. I love how you said that. It's like your, your motherhood kind of brought out, um, sort of like a self-discovery in you. Yeah, and really. Has. Could you tell us a little bit about what what your life was like before you had kids? What what was your what was your job and um how was it such a stark difference? Well, before I had kids, um I was the admissions and marketing director for a uh Bible's college. So I was helping kids get into school and I was doing a lot of ministry stuff. So mm -hmm. if the kids had certain struggles, uh, personal struggles in their life, they're struggling with their, their relationship with God, struggling with drugs, struggling with, you know, something that was going on. I was kind of like the counselor. They would, you know, come in and I was able to uh, really minister to them and, and pray with them and give them direction for their life and encourage them. Um, I was also in ministry. So I was doing a lot of small groups and teachings and trainings and speakings and, and all these things that I love to do. And I was just at the beginning stages of kind of birthing, like giving myself a chance to do the things that I wanted to do. And, um, so I felt like I had just got started in this stuff and then it got shut down, like out of nowhere, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, that was, that was, I think part of what was difficult for me. Um, but I love helping people. I just, and what I, my passion is to actually help women who know they have something great inside of them, but life has thrown them down, thrown them a curveball, knocked them down, whether it's a divorce or they've, you know, had children and it wasn't what they expected or depression or they're lost a spouse, something happened. And they know that it's time. It's time to step up and move on in their life and find themselves again. Mm -hmm. Because it's so easy to, to lose ourselves in life. Right. But yet, you know, you have that aching feeling, even though you're in the midst of the pain, you have that aching feeling inside. I know there's more. I know I could do more. I know I meant for more. I know there's greatness in me but I don't know how to access it. I've been knocked down so hard. You know, how do I get back up? And so my passion is to help women find that again, to give them mm -hmm. practical, simple, easy tools to make positive steps, you know, in the right direction. And that, that's what I had to do to overcome. Mm -hmm. And now I'm actually grateful that I went through this because I think it's my mission to help other people going through it. Amazing. So can you tell us a little bit about how you found the motivation to pull yourself out of that dark space? Yeah. Um, the funny thing was, I don't really think I woke up one day and had motivation as much as I woke up one day and I looked at myself and I thought, this is not, this is not who I want to be. Like I had lost six years of depression. It slowly eats away. 
at your thought process, your emotional health, your physical health. I mean, you just, everything just gets eaten away. And after six years, you just, you look back and it's like, it's like having a famine for six years somewhere. Mm-hmm. And you're going to, you come back and you visit six years later, like, this is not the same place I just visited. It's dead. It's desolate. It's, you know, and that's, that's who I had become in a lot of ways on the inside. And so I, I realized that I don't want to be this person. Like, I know I can do more. I know I'm better than this. And I was like, I'm going to change. I'm I'm going to make a change. And I think at the beginning of the depression, I did, because, you know, I, I hate to say that because then people go, oh, well, then just decide you're not going to be depressed. And like, <laughs> their, depression is too complicated there. And depending on where you're at in depression, what you're struggling with, the beginning of my depression, I promise you, I did everything possible to get out of it the first few years. And I just... I could, I couldn't, I don't know what happened. It was beyond my control. So I'm not trying to say that you can just, oh, my depression, I'm just made a choice. But I think I was finally at a place where my hormones were under control. A lot of the factors that were affecting my depression were kind of getting under control. And I was at a place where I finally could make that choice. And I did. And I just said, I want to be who I was born to be. And I'm sick and tired of sitting here negative and depressed. And, um, so I did a couple things, if you want me to share. With you. Yes, please I did a couple share. Um, that helped me kind of, that I helped me personally. So the first thing was, I, I am a Christian, so I don't mean to preach to anybody, but my, uh, my relationship with God was a big factor. I picked up my Bible and I started actually reading it <laughs> consistently instead of letting it have dust on the shelf. And, uh, that was a really big part for me, um, because I began to hear another voice. I began to hear you are valuable. I created you for a purpose. You know, you, you, um, are loved, you know, and I began to hear besides my own little voice saying, you know, you're not good enough. What a bad mom. You're so depressed. Look at all the other moms on Facebook. They're so happy and you're miserable. You know, I, I started hearing another voice. (laughs) And so that was a big one. Reading books, reading is, this is why I'm writing a book because reading has been the number one thing that has changed my life. Being able to pick up that book and write in it and highlight it and reread it. And, um, it's just, it's been transformational. So I started reading books that were going to challenge my negative mindset Mm -hmm. and encourage me to make positive choices. I just needed to stop thinking so negatively and hopelessly. Like, was oh, there any you books that you want to recommend to our audience that that really um, yeah, helped you? I have to think through because a lot of the stuff I read is like uh, religious, so I don't know. Um, one of my favorite books is Battlefield of the Mind. It's by Joyce Meyer, and it's it's a fabulous book. I read it every year, and it really breaks down negative and bad mindsets and how they just destroy our lives. You know, our, our choices that we make are really just a result, you know, of what's in our mind. Um, the other thing is podcasts, which I'm so honored to be on your podcast. Um, I truly feel blessed because I hope somebody will hear our voices, um, from your audience and that they will be able to say, I am not alone in this because podcasts have been so helpful to me being you know one of the things I love about podcasts is that there were days where especially when I was beginning to get out of the depression I didn't have the motivation to pick up a book I just yeah. I just couldn't you know I was just do like sometimes reading feels like work you know yeah. and I'm like I just don't have it in me to read a book or it just felt too overwhelming but I knew that I could stick some airpods in my ear and press play on my on my phone and yeah. I could listen to something right. and that's where podcast came in. So I started finding these podcasts that would speak life into me. And, and while I was doing the dishes or whatever, I was going to have to fold laundry anyways. I might as well put on my podcast and um, you, you know, you can't underestimate the value of um, hearing these positive messages and giving you those little tiny bits of hope. They, they build up. They really do. They really do begin to equal a massive transformation over time, you know? So mm-hmm. I think the reading and the, the podcasts were phenomenal. Um, another thing that I did was exercise. Mm-hmm. I underestimated the connection between the mind and the body and the spirit. 
it's like if one improves somehow it brings it all you know all the other ones with it you know that saying you know a, a ship in harbor you know the the tide rises all the ships right they all rise and so when i started exercising it really started i started being more positive i started having more energy um so I think it's important that we don't neglect the physical, you know, we, we mm -hmm. focus so much on the emotions when we're in depression and we don't think about the physical part. Um, the third thing I did was I joined some small groups like, like mops. I don't know if you've heard of mops before it's, mm -hmm. it stands for moms of preschoolers. So oh. it's like a little, you know, you, you show up and you have like a main meeting and then you break into the same small groups every week. And it was like, I was finally in a world with other moms who were going through what I was going through. And I realized I am not alone. Like, oh, that's hard for you too. Oh, like you struggle with bedtime. It's not just me being a horrible mother or, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and, and so the friendships, um, mm -hmm. really those three things I think were the practical baby steps that I started doing consistently. And that really gave me a foundation, enough of a foundation that I could then start to dream again and believe again and, you know, go out and try to do yeah. something again. <laughs> That's amazing. So do you have any tips for new moms just right after they have their baby to overcome these kind of struggles or maintain some sort of balance? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think one of the big ones is don't compare yourself to anyone, any other moms don't do it. it every mom's journey is different. Mm -hmm. And when we try to compare ourselves, we only see one side of the other person. We see them on their good hair day when their yeah. kid is like perfectly happy. And then we only see ourselves on our worst hair day when our kids are screaming. And, you know, we just, we don't have a fair, you know, perspective. So don't compare yourself to other moms. Don't right. feel like you have to do it like another mom. Don't feel like you're less than if you don't do it the way she does the organic food and you don't like, don't like, don't get caught up in that stuff. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, when we, when we birth our kid, it's like given to us like an internal compass. Like we know what's right for our kid. We know what's right yep. for our kid and right for our family. And what's right for us is not always going to be right for Sally down the street. And like, that doesn't matter. We're not Sally down the street. You know, you know, follow your heart. You know what your kid needs. You know what your family needs and focus on that and don't let the, you know, comparison of other moms right. put you in this guilt trip or into mm -hmm. a negative space because you're already doing the best that you can. You don't mm -hmm. need to heap all this, you know, mom guilt on top of you that shouldn't even be there. Yeah, um, totally the other agree. thing that I think I would tell them is don't allow yourself to feel ashamed mm -hmm. or embarrassed if you mm -hmm. are struggling. Mm -hmm. because we all struggle. And this was what was hard for me before I struggled with this. I didn't struggle with many things in life. Most everything I did was succeed and, and was, was good. And, and I just, I hadn't really struggled a whole lot and I should have looked at the struggle as life. That's normal life. But instead right. I looked at it as something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. you know, we're not all good at everything. It took me a long time to learn to be the mom that I am. And that's okay. Some yeah. of my mom friends, it just came natural. It's like the baby came out and they were like, yeah, you know, for me, it was a big adjustment. And, and I have other moms who, who wouldn't know the first thing about writing a book and I am knocking this thing out, you know? So it's like, it's okay. Like we're different and yeah. it's okay to struggle. It's okay. If being a mom is hard, it's okay. Right. If you're not good at everything, you know, just give yourself grace. <laughs> <laughs> so. I, I love that. I love that. I mean, I think also uh, you mentioned that the struggle of like social media as well, you know, seeing other moms and of course, social media is only one side of the coin and you're right. Yeah. You, know, you don't see, you don't always see the struggles. And I think, but now I think there's more and more people that are showing, showing the real side, showing really what it is like postpartum and, and, 
So if they're struggling. Yeah. And I, I love that, you know, your goal is also to help other, you know, other moms going through, you know, a big adjustment. And I think that your your story is very powerful for other women. Well, thank you. Thank you. I really do want to be a voice because I did not have one when I was going through this. I had, mm -hmm. besides, you know, my very few close family members, I didn't have anybody. And I just wish somebody had told me I it wasn't something wrong with me and that I, that I wasn't the only one, you know, and I really hope if there's any moms listening and they're struggling, they understand, you know, you are not alone and it's okay. And a, a, a bright sunny day does come after the rain. You just have to hang in there. You know, you will come out of it. Mm. Okay, wonderful. I actually was wondering if you, um, in term, you were a, a personal trainer before? Yes, yes, I was. Um, you so you didn't exercise during the during the six years, or you you were still exercising, or you you couldn't you didn't feel. You... I did not work out at all for. Yeah, see, I'm trying to think of what the date is that I became a trainer. Jordan was, yeah, like Jordan was like five or six when I started doing personal training. Oh, so, so that after I first started exercising and then I, I did it for about a year and then I, my husband's job shifted. And then I went, I, I did it like, I did it like a few hours a day while the mm -hmm. kids were in school. If that makes sense. Oh, okay. So, so it was after, um, the postpartum depression. Well, so. it was kind of like, uh, it was, it was probably, I probably had one or two years left in me. I'll have to look up the dates because I need to be able to answer this question <laughs> if this comes up. So I need to look at the dates. Um, but because Jordan was in Tinder. Yeah. So I still had probably one, no, one year, one year. My, it was, it was after that year, I quit doing my personal training and then it was like, like three or four months later that I made my decision, I was going to change my life. And then, but, and I was doing personal training, I've been an athlete my whole life. I, I was a NCIA certified personal trainer. I loved it. But the funny thing was I didn't really work out myself <laughs> very much um, <laughs> because, I'm, because I was a college athlete and because I was naturally pretty like looking physically fit, I was able to I know that sounds so bad, but um, <laughs> I was able to do most of the, like, I, like I can do it. And I know, I know all about lifting and fitness and now I just, I wasn't living it myself, if that makes sense. Oh, I totally, I, I get you. I get I, you. I, but once I made a decision, I'm getting out of this. That's when I personally joined a gym and started doing, I started doing CrossFit. Oh, I see. I see. And do then. Do you also, um, do you also talk about that in your, in your blog about your training and things like that or for moms oh, at oh, all? I, do, or I talk just... about, um, my, unfortunately I haven't done a whole lot of blog posts. I just started all this. So, um, I'm a oh, newbie, totally fine. so I apologize, yeah. but, um, yes, I'm actually, the book that I'm writing is called the five non-negotiables. I don't know what we'll actually title it, but that's like the title for now. And it's about the five areas of our lives that we keep doing these little tiny negotiations. And then we're going to look back on our life and say, oh my gosh, I never did this or that. And, and we think it's a, it's not a major life decision that keeps us from reaching our goal. It's all these little compromises we're making along the way. And so these five areas, um, one of them is health. And you talk about if you are negotiating in your health now, you're not going to have the fitness that you need when you retire to, to be with your grandkids or travel or, or, or start that second business. And so I have a whole section on food and, um, and, and fitness and health and stuff like that. Um, I have one on family, you know, motherhood, marriage, you know, so like each of these five. So I start my book with one of all of the five, I am butchering this. The five topics, I have like a chapter on each one. And then the second half of the book is like the importance of habits, 
how to find your motivation, like all the things you need to not compromise. One of my oh, favorite chapters is about being derailed because, you know, gosh, as a mom, I feel like I'm always derailed. Like I'm, I'm, on, I set a schedule, I'm on a task and then the kid gets sick or, and I have to, you know, I have to take care of them instead of doing my goal. And how do you get back on track when you're constantly being derailed? And that is super important because when we can't get back on track right away, well, you know, the one week we didn't make it to the gym because the kid was sick turns into two and then turns into three. And the next thing you know, we haven't been in the gym in two months and we're starting all over again. And then we start over again so many times that eventually we're like, I can't do this anymore. Like, I just, I just can't reach my goal. Like, it's just not possible because yeah. I've started a hundred times and I'm never going to finish. And part of it's because we're not good at coming back from derailments, you know? Mm -hmm. So like, I have all these chapters, <laughs> sorry, I'm like over sharing, but no, no, no. I love, I love what you're sharing. I just, I, I should have asked you about, um, you know, what, uh, yeah, what your book is about, <laughs> but, um, I actually don't even we talk about it just because it's not even, it's in editing and it's, it's quite a ways. I've written the entire thing, 90,000 words, 17 wow. chapters, but it, wow. it needs so much editing. I don't know when I'm actually going to, like, if I knew like, oh, I'm going to release my book on this day, then I would be, you know, all this is actually the first time I've talked about it with anybody, like, besides <gasps> my family. So, um, okay. that's a, so, uh, I just, I'm like, well, if I promote it, everyone's gonna be like, when can I get it? And I'm going to sound like an idiot. Like, I don't really know. <laughs> uh, uh, that's okay. okay. Well, you, what you got to do is you got to tell me when that happens, we'll have to do another one. Okay. Okay, <laughs> that would be fun. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. So, um, what is this derailment? I'm really interested in what you mean by uh, how do you how do you how do you get back on track? So, basically, have a plan for your plan, backup plan for your backup plan. Because when you get derailed, sometimes we think, okay, my kid's home from sick, home from school sick, I can't go to the gym, right? So then we just think uh, one of the things that causes us to not get on, on track is this all or nothing mentality. Well, if I can't go to the gym, then I can't work out. It's like we, in our brain, we put these two together. I do this all the time because I'm an extreme, I'm an extreme person. And if I can't be all in, why do it at all? But I don't stop and think about the fact that, okay, I've been derailed today. That's plan. Plan A was the gym, but guess what? I've got a plan B. Plan B is, you know, turbo fitness that I have on my iPad, you know, and I'm going to get, I'm going to plug it on and I'm going to do my workout or whatever, you know, my, my Amazon workout video, whatever you have, uh, that's plan B, you know, and then if that doesn't work out, then you have a plan C, you know? And so one of the things is just, if something's really important to you, you have to have more than just plan A because plan A rarely happens as a mom. It's usually plan B or C that we end up doing, but instead we think, well, if I can't go to the gym, I can't work out. And having that mentality that doing something is better than nothing. Mm -hmm. So, and, and honestly doing the five minute workout, you may think, well, like, it's not really that you didn't really accomplish a lot for your body. Even if I didn't accomplish a lot for my body, I accomplished a lot for my habits and my mentality because I showed up, I kept the habit. I didn't, cause you know, when you skip a day for some, at least for me, if I skip one day, it's like, oh my gosh, like, I, I don't know why I come up with, I come up with a reason to skip day two and day three. And it just, it just compiles. I need yeah. to stay consistent. So that five minutes is just enough to keep Get me you to do the next one and the, the group, next one, you know? Next yeah. One. So I don't, I have several things in there. I have like, like four things to help with derailment and, um, um, Actually, I opened the book with a story. I totally made the story up, <laughs> but it's about an old man and he lives in a landlocked village and he keeps hearing, the merchants come through all the time and they tell these amazing tales of the ocean, like these huge eight legged creatures, you know, and this ginormous whales. And he's like, this ocean sounds incredible, you know? And so he actually bought one of those big conca shells that you can hear the ocean you know, and he's like, one day I am going to go see this ocean. And the years go by and the old man gets sick. And the doctor says, I'm sorry, but you're not going to make it. Is there anything I can get you for your last few days? And the old man says, yes. Can you please go get me my seashell? 
And the doctor's like, that's kind of weird, but okay. So he grabs the shell and the old man puts it up to his ear and he starts to cry. And the doctor's like, why are you crying? And he said, I never saw the ocean. Mm -hmm. And the whole point of my book is going to see your ocean, but we don't see our ocean because we made some amazing financial investment that kept us financially secure for the rest of our lives. And we could do whatever we want. We, we reach our ocean because we made these little habits that every day took us one step closer to that goal. And instead we negotiate ourselves out of these little steps and we're negotiating ourselves out of our oceans. And so I talk about the importance of the little things. And I'm so glad that this is part of the message I'm sharing because for me going through depression, I could only do the little things. I couldn't do big things. It was too much. It was too overwhelming. That's why like when we're talking about podcasts, I'm like some days I couldn't even pick the book up. Like I needed a podcast because I needed to just, Pop in your phones. That's all the strength I had for the day. So it's all about the little things. But I didn't realize the power of little things over time Mm -hmm. create a huge leap in your life, you know? Amazing. I'm sorry. I'm rambling. (laughs) No, you're not rambling. You're so cute. I love it. My my passion. I'm like, (laughs) <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love what you're sharing. I love your story. I love I love everything about you. You're awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show. Um, how can our guests find you? Yes, I am on Facebook and Instagram, Chelsea Dishinger. My name's super hard to spell. Should I spell it out? <laughs> oh, that's okay. We'll have it in the link, guys. <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm on Facebook. I mean, because my name's so funky and long, it's really hard to miss, you know, if you type me in, you're going to find me. I'm Chelsea Dishinger. Um, I also have a blog at chelseadishinger.com and, um, I try to post, you know, helpful, you know, here's easy ways to help with depression or here's ways to do this as a mother, you know, so, uh, you can follow me any of those three ways. (laughs) Okay, wonderful. And guys, don't forget to follow Kumfuama Show at Facebook and IG and our YouTube at Sorry Sarah Chang. Thanks so much for being on the show today. Thank you for having me.